Happy to welcome everybody who's joining the Christ Journey family once again. Maybe this is your first time with us and you honor us with your presence, whether you're physically in one of our campuses, shout out to Kendall Campus, Gables Campus, or you're joining us right from your own living room or your own private space over uh, our church online. We're glad to have you with us. And I would love for you to repeat after me these words, would you? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let's try saying that all as one phrase together with me. Ready? Here we go. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that matters especially in light of the chapters and the reality that are before us today. And uh, to get to that, I want to remind you, as a boy I learned to rhyme. I don't know where I picked it up, but I remember repeating it loud and proud. Went like this. You ever heard it? Second verse. Same as the first, a little bit louder, a little bit worse. Because as I was reading the apocalypse, the unveiling is what that means, of the seven trumpets and then the seven bowls that are to follow, that line came to mind. It's like, wait, haven't I already heard some of this? <laughs> yeah, the, the, they're now rolling out. What I heard in the seals is now rolling out in the trumpets and is going to come with even greater impact in the bowls that we are going to get to in the future. Each rollout increasing in intensity. It's like God's steamroller is driving down the street of human history and bringing its full weight upon everything in its path. And here's what it looks like. If you want to see the trumpets and the bowls side by side in the judgments coming on the earth, there's the land and the plants, the sea and the salt water, the rivers and the fresh water, the heavens, the armies of torment, those nightmarish locusts, that catastrophe that we heard just a moment ago, and then the nations all stirred up and enraged in rebellion against God. And I'm, I'm showing you that in this synopsis just to say this. There should be enough there to see that this is pretty heavy duty. I mean, this is like God-sized stuff. In Dr. N.T. Wright's commentary, Revelation for Everyone, he reminds us of a sign that he saw outside a church building. It said this, many people want to serve God, but only in an advisory capacity. What we're going to read here, I mean, when we start unloading and unpacking the contents of these chapters, I'm telling you, it's hard not to feel like giving God some advice. Like, what are you thinking? What kind of God is this? What's going on here? And how does that doesn't sound like Jesus to me? So I'm just telling you, you may find yourself there today. All the more reason for us to remember this. Each week we have been seeking to take hold of the promise that is made at the opening chapter of the Revelation, where the writer says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what's written in it because the time is near. The blessing of readiness is what we're asking God to help us find today. So part of the question that we're trying to ask, or that I would ask you to seek answer to in the text is this, what's the blessing that you want us to find here, Lord? You have a blessing for me today? then would you help me see it and hear it in spite of everything else that's going on? Because there's a ton in these chapters. Dr. Wright's commentary on chapters 8 through 11 has 26 pages in his commentary. Dr. Newport, who was my professor in his book, The Lion and the Lamb, has 30 pages expanding, exploring the contents of the. Maybe it'll help you to know that I only have like four and a half pages. <laughs> and it takes, I usually typically take around 30 minutes to, you know, to deliver a message. 13 minutes are required to read the text itself. So thank you, Worship Arts, for helping us do some of that in advance so we might offer a little bit more time for some um, interpretive commentary. But in the previous reading, we were introduced to six of those seven trumpets. And uh, we see that the trumpets are judgment upon nature, and those that are Bible students will realize that they, these sound like the plagues of Egypt. In fact, I got a chart on that too for you to show you that what we're hearing in the trumpets and in the bowls is akin to what you read in the book of Exodus where Moses was fighting with Pharaoh. Remember that? 
hail and fire, a third on the earth, a third on vegetation, a third on the sea turns to blood, a third of the ships are destroyed. Now, biblically, that compares with the Nile River turning to blood. The third trumpet shows us that freshwater pollution comes when a flaming torch falls out of heaven and then it poisons all the water. It's like a reversal of the miracle of the bitter waters of Merah, where the waters that were bitter were sweetened as they entered the promised land. Now the waters that were sweet now grow bitter because the promised land is not where we're going. That's the symbolic image there. Um, so uh, earlier in the fourth, but we also need to remember this. Um, well, let me get to this first. The fourth trumpet affects the sun, the moon, the stars. That's like the plague of darkness that came all over Egypt as their sun god was challenged by the god of creation. Hal Lindsey, by the way, sees that all of these damages coming to the earth as the fallout from a thermonuclear explosion and the disaster that follows. Now, we don't know that. And I need to tell you this, it's very risky to draw 21st century conclusions from 1st century symbols that are not in the text. So we're, we're giving careful reading to the text itself. But earlier, the fourth seal that was opened says that death and Hades were given their power to kill a fourth of the earth. And then in the trumpets, we see the symbol one-third of the earth. So what's the difference here? Oh, okay, there was a fourth, and now it's a third. Uh, and let me remind you, these are symbolic numbers. But what's it saying? Well, a fourth was literally saying, you know, judgment has begun for real, but there's three-fourths of it yet to come. So we're on the early side. So if you're open to changing your ways before it gets to you, you've got some time now. Now, with the trumpet sounding, what happens? Oh, a third more. So now we're over halfway there. And he's essentially saying, so if you're open to paying attention that the steamroller is coming down the street and you want to move before it gets to you, this is your chance. Symbolically saying, okay, it began and now it's continuing and it's on its way, more to come, and uh, in its full force. So fifth trumpet, we see this locust horde of nightmarish demon forces, which also the locusts were a way that uh, Moses wreaked havoc with Pharaoh. But rising from the abyss, this black hole where they have been kept, and yet now they're allowed to torment those who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. That happened earlier in chapter 9. So he's telling us the church of God, the, church, the people of God are safe even as this is being unleashed. And though your body may be taken from you as martyrs, because that's what was happening in the first century, there were martyrs' bodies of believers that were killed because they wouldn't worship the emperor of Rome, but they worshiped Jesus only. And he was saying, though your bodies may die, God's wrath will not get to you. You are safely secured in him. And then the sixth trumpet calls on four more fallen angels. We saw a demonic horde unleashed. Actually, you know, the word apocalypse means unveiling. It means something that was hidden now is coming into sight. And so what John is saying is that there's been a spiritual warfare going on and a supernatural battle that has now coming. It's now rising in temperature, and it's being made. I'm bringing it out where you can see it. You typically don't see where your torment is coming from, but now it's plain to see. And then the army this four fallen angels that are leading amounted troops that numbering over 200 million. That's an army inconceivable at the time that Revelation was written and yet now released to kill a third of humanity. Remember, these are symbolic numbers, but he's saying the army likewise comes from beyond the Euphrates. What does that mean? Well, in Bible language, the Euphrates River marked the boundary of the northern part of the kingdom. And so the heathen opponents, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, they're across the Euphrates River. So symbolically, he's saying that the river is going to dry up and they're going to be able to move in. The steamroller will be coming from the north like the enemies of Israel did in time past. Now, Hal Lindsey, he's a dispensationalist. He believes that is represented in the armies of China. 200 million soldiers. Warren Wearsby, 
who is also a dispensationalist, but here's what he says about that. He says, to point to some nation like China, obviously he's talking to Hal, isn't he? Like China is to miss the message that John is trying to convey, which is what we're trying to see. What is John trying to tell us? Well, verse 20, let's just look at what comes next. What comes next? What's the next message? The rest of mankind that were not killed from these plagues still didn't repent. <laughs> not from the work of their hands. They didn't stop worshiping demons, idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, wood, idols that cannot see, they cannot hear, they cannot walk, nor did they repent of the murders, magic arts, immorality, or theft. So even with God's steamroller coming down doing holy justice in his world, and people are facing the yet restrained Justice of Almighty Holy God, they still choose their sinful ways instead of turning to Him. It's a very symbolic portrayal of that. They, they, don't, they don't want their self indulgent, self absorbed selfishness interrupted. And it's just such a portrayal of human arrogance in display. We want a God who lets me have my way without consequence. And it's like personal autonomy which we embrace that value, but gone to seed. So now everybody is doing what they think is right in their own eyes, but actually what's really happening is they're following the gods and becoming like their false gods. In choosing against the living God, they're settling for gods of gold, for bigger bank accounts, bigger pleasures in bed, whatever it and breaking the commandments of God, whatever it takes to get what I want. And they're not able to change. What's he saying? They've become like the gods they worship. They're spiritually dead. There's no life in them. They're blind. They don't even see their own problems. Have you ever had a relationship with somebody who doesn't see the mess they're in and they're blaming you for it? And you're going, wait a minute. How can you say that when you're the one who's doing this? It's because they're becoming spiritually blind. And that's what John is saying. The world has gone blind. They don't see God. They're losing their capacity. They don't feel God. They're dead spiritually. They're becoming deaf, just like money, gold. It doesn't talk. It doesn't listen. <laughs> but they're acting, so they're losing their ability to hear, and they're bound. They're getting all tied up. They can't get out of the steamroller's way. Why? Because though they think they have the power, when it comes to changing their lives, they don't. This is the picture that's being painted. They can't get themselves free. But justice is coming. And then chapters 10 and 11 bring us to this interlude before the final trumpet sounds. So, so would you stand with me for the reading? Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud, had a rainbow over his head. His face was like the sun. And his legs were like fiery pillars, and he was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land, and then he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the voice of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said. And do not write it down. And then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, the sea and all that is in it, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants the prophets. And then the voice that I'd heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It'll turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth, it, it will be sweet like honey. And so I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and I ate it and it tasted as sweet 
as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. And then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. And I was given a, a reed like a measuring rod, and I was told to go measure the temple of God and the altar and count the number of worshipers there. But exclude the outer court and don't measure it because it's been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city 42 months. And I will give my power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. Clothed in sackcloth, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the sky that it will not rain during the time that they are prophesying. And they have the power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss to attack will attack them and overpower them and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and they will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two had tormented those who live on the earth. But after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. And then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in that earthquake. And the survivors were terrified and gave glory to God, to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our, God, of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and they worshiped God saying, we give you thanks, thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, to the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both great and small, for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened. And within it was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Please be seated. May it please God to help us find his blessing. There's blessing in there somewhere. For those listening and looking and willing to take it to heart, I'm praying that that'll be you. Have you ever used a VR headset, a virtual reality headset? You know, it just like you put it on and you just enter into this other world. It's like an immersive experience that completely swallows up your entire perspective. As I read this, I'm imagining that is what John is experiencing. It's like everywhere he turns, there's image, there's voice, there's sound, there's fury, there's wreckage, there's destruction, there's power, there's courage. 
it's, it's like a disaster movie where cities and populations are like rolling over and being swallowed whole. Or like this kaleidoscope um, of art by Salvador Dali <laughs> or by Picasso. It's like, what is that? And, it, and it's moving. What does it mean? Well, we know it's symbolic. That's what apocalyptic language is written in, symbol. Um, but the symbols, man, these are frightening symbols. Some of them are just freakish. You know, they're confusing. It's like a nightmare, like you're having this nightmare that's like, ah, and then all of a sudden it becomes glorious and triumphant, and you're even hearing words from the hallelujah chorus. Did you know that's what this came from? The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. And yes, right here. The context for those words comes right out of this chapter. And it says like this roller coaster of ups and downs and twists and turns and so many curiosity questions. Like, what is that? And it's meant to be a question book. But remember, our purpose here isn't to answer all those questions. Our time is limited. I already told you that. And though we're reading at a ground level, grassroots level, we're not leaving a single word out because of the promise of blessing that it says will come to those who read and hear and then take it to heart. Uh, we're flying over it at a helicopter height. We're observing key points of interest and saying, hey, pay attention to that, pay attention to that. There's more down there, but, you know, we're, got to, we're on our flyby here. So I'm telling you that today because I'm hoping that the clues that you take will be like little appetizers in your spiritual menu. And then you will access the resources that we are making available to you on the Christ Journey app for your deepening study yourself that you will choose to investigate what's of interest to you and then find out and then listen as God speaks to you. But I also want to offer a few comments and overview. The trumpets, one through four, there's seven trumpets, the first four trumpets depict judgment coming to the natural world. Land, water, sea, sky, and then the fifth and sixth trumpet into the supernatural reality. The reality that's behind what we see with our physical eyes. But there's an unveiling of the actual spiritual battle that takes place for human beings. And, uh, and it's being seen. And so we see, what do we see? We see a world at war. These are the trumpets that sound for war. We see a world corrupted by these demon locusts from the abyss who torment and torture prepared for battle. So that which creates the animosity, hostility, horror, and nightmares of our world is suddenly main scene. Where does it come from? We'll talk about it more in another message. But in 7, it says, verse 7 says, they're led by a fallen angel named Destroyer. That's trumpet five. Trumpet six shows us a world at war once again, but now conflicted as four fallen angels are released to assemble this mounted force from the Euphrates. We already said that that was symbolic of the heathen forces that are now going to be unleashed on the world as if it were Israel under Assyria or Babylon. What does it mean? Well, <laughs> I'm trying to make sense of this. I think it's saying that it's conflicted because even as the destruction is rolling out from the steamroller of God's justice, verse 20, humanity doesn't turn. It's just like Pharaoh. Just hardens his heart harder. Doesn't stop worshiping false gods. Continues to treat gold as if it were God. To acquire more material wealth as if that is God. Or to try to conquer as many bedrooms as possible because that's what I want when I want it. And so the, the false gods are still being worshipped and the Ten Commandments are still being broken left and right. And, uh, and so it, people are enslaved to sin. So chapters 8 and 9 end and chapter 10 opens with this angel, glorious angel, clothed in glory with the power of God, giving voice to the seven thunders. When do you hear thunder? In the middle of a storm, right? 
Who is it that the spoken power behind the perfect storm? Seven, number of perfect storm is good. Perfect storm is rolling out. Gods of ending justice will no longer delay. It's like, okay, there was a fourth, there was a third, but now, oh my, here comes the rest of it. And the reader is being prepared to say, oh, time's up. If you're getting out of the pool, you should already be over there. And the angel stands between heaven and earth, full of God's glory, come to do cleanup work for the creator. This is God's world, not ours. And the long-awaited day of the Lord that was foretold to the ancient prophets is now coming to pass. And the experience is going to be bittersweet, he says. Right? Which, by the way, you just hit the pause button for a second. Isn't that the normal course of human justice, bittersweet? That justice itself is always bittersweet for a victim to be attended, the violator suffers loss. This is justice. Justice is win, lose. It will always be bitter for some to be sweet for others. That's human justice. You can think about that later as well. But John is told there's more to it than simply the execution of justice. John, I want you tasting this. I want you experiencing this. So he says, I want you to taste the sweetness in your mouth and then the sour in your stomach. And then he tells them, and now go preach. Nothing helps a preacher deliver the truth like a dose of reality. Of what is the end in sight when justice is fully done? And is it time for you to get ready before the steamroller comes your way? So John takes the taste, and then we're, and then he says, next he measures the temple. We're brought to the place where every one of God's people are counted and are inside. That's another image of security. The justice is rolling out, but God's mercy has got you safe and secure in Christ. In the midst of a world at war, and now we don't have time to explain because it's limited, but John is told, you got to preach, and then the next thing we see being sent out was another image. These are symbolic, remember, two witnesses that are bearing witness. What is it that Christians do? We bear witness. Um, in the midst of a world at war that is symbolized in verse 8 of chapter 11, the city of Satan, the word, this is the world without God. People who live their lives as if there's no God. We have a godless world, godless governments, godless societies, godless realities, godless cultures. And now a world without God that will not honor and worship him that is represented by Sodom. That's a symbol of people depraved. Egypt, that's a symbol of people enslaved. And that's typically what happens when we follow our depravity. We get ourselves trapped. And then over this kind of world, Jesus Christ is lifted high as crucified. Why? Because he, these are the kind of people God wants to be saved. It's a vision of God's mercy. Satan's forces are trying to kill the people that are bearing witness to the saving grace of God in Christ in the middle of a world that's enslaved. And it's going to look like evil has triumphed. And then the bodies of those martyrs, this witnessing church that continues to tell other people about the love of God in Christ, a breath of God Verse 11 is going to appear. They are resurrected. They rise to the heavens. Now, I don't know if this is what people call the rapture, but I can tell you this is why people say there's a mid-tribulation rapture, not a pre-tribulation rapture. This is the text right here because caught up in the air with the enemies watching. And then as the seventh trumpet sounds, that's where we get these words from the hallelujah chorus. The kingdom of the world is becoming the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. So this worship resounds in a bittersweet celebration of our Savior God, Messiah King, taking leadership because it's time. Time for what? Time for judging, time for rewarding, and then we see the purpose behind God's justice, time for destroying those who destroy the earth, verse 18. See, this is God's world, and he is the creator of it, and one day he's going to clean it up, and that's what's happening here. He's going to destroy those that are destroying by sin the world and reality that he made for himself. But look at verse 19. The temple of heaven is suddenly opened. It's like before we slip out of this amazing image vision, there's another little, like, 
piece of it that he looks over. He says he sees the Ark of the Covenant. Now, remember, these are symbols. We're being invited into a symbolic journey in this, like, spiritual VR. And, um, and it says that there was a voice from beyond the horns of the altar. This is chapter 9, verse 13. We're given two glimpses into the Holy of Holies, by the way. That's what I'm talking about. The first one came after the unleashing of that locust horde and then the 200 million army that are led by a demon. That sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? But you know where the command came from to unleash that? The golden horns of the altar. That means that behind, before... You should be frightened of any evil force of whatever size and impact from wherever it comes, even belts from the belly of hell. You should know the God of creation because he is the perfect power, the golden horns. Horns represent power, gold, purity. We've got the purity power of almighty God that is superior to any demon force or any size of army. And we're secure in his word. And then the other glimpse happens in the last of chapter 11. This last verse, John says, I see God's temple in heaven open, and there was the Ark of the Covenant. What is that? Well, when you get to know the Hebrew story of the Bible, you'll see that the Ark of the Covenant, yes, this is Raiders of the Lost Ark. This is that Ark. That's the holiest item in the temple and reflects the heart of God's holiness and redemptive grace for his people. And so here John is, all of the steamroller is rolling out now, and it's coming down the street, but the last glimpse he has is of the safe place in the middle of the temple where the heart of God has been opened for those willing to look. Even as justice is being meted out. Oh, exhale, <laughs> inhale, exhale. Uh, this is a lot, isn't it? I mean, stand, like we've been standing in front of an open fire hydrant with torrents just raging in on us. And, and it, uh, where do we go with this? Well, here's where I'd like to conclude. Every time I prepare a message, I pray that God will grace me to be an instrument of his peace toward you in two ways. In something that you're feeling and something that you're doing. Like, what do you feel and what do you want to do? What are you feeling right now? So I would just invite you to, to enter into that question. What am I feeling toward God right now and what do I want to do? And I don't know what those are for you each week, but after a message like today's, heavy, dense, maybe freaky, a little frightening, weird, uh, as your pastor, what am I praying for you to be feeling right now? And I'll cut right to it, okay? I'm praying that you're feeling overwhelmed in several degrees. And you should rightly feel overwhelmed. That's what I'm praying is that you will feel overwhelmed in one sense by the realization that everything we've been talking about is way too big for any of us to fully grasp. That's part of the message truth here, I think. And then we're supposed to say, whoa, God, capital G, capital O, capital D, God. Yeah, yeah, it's overwhelming to me. It's too much. And I would warn every person listening, if you ever find a preacher who says that he's got all the answers here, you're in trouble already. Because we are the servants of capital G-O-D. We are not the voice of God. So... That's the first thing. Let's feel a little overwhelmed with that. If this seems like too much for you, it feels like too much for me too because I am not God and neither are you. And that's part of what we're supposed to learn here. Uh, the second, the realization that, um, that God's holiness and justice is ultimately going to take evil to task at every level for every person in every place. And to me, that is a, that's an unnerving thought. And yet, right in the middle of that roll, that, that steamroller, in this roller coaster we're riding, we see these repeated glimpses of God's mercy that has us secure and has us in his grip if we are willing to turn his direction. So I hope that you'll feel yourself in there somewhere, that you'll feel known. God knows. He knows what you're doing. He knows what's going on in your life, that you'll feel seen 
You may not want to be seen by God, but he sees you. He sees you with a heart of love and says, and here's the heart of my temple for you. And then I'm thinking maybe you could think, how weird is it that, that this word, how alive is this word that in seeing themes from an ancient document would feel like reading headlines in our present culture? What are you feeling? And then secondly, what do you want to do? Faith without works is dead. How about this? Maybe, listen to the scripture again. Get out the audio Bible and our Christ Journey app and just listen to these chapters and ask God to speak through his spirit to give you one point of clarity. You don't get to understand the whole thing. Wait, wait, what? No, just ask him one point of clarity. Lord, are you trying to say something to me? You trying to get my attention? Is that why I'm snagged? What I'm, what I'm feeling is uneasy. What I'm feeling is like I want to get up in the middle of the movie and leave. Okay, then ask yourself, what's that coming from? Where's it coming from? Lean into that. Let's lean into some truth. What are you feeling? And what do you want to do? I want to get out of here. Okay, why? And why would you not want to be in the embrace of God who loves you? Maybe God, God, are you trying to say something to me? God, are you trying to offer me some correction before I get in too deep somewhere else? Our culture is so steeped in... uh, And saturated in privilege and permissiveness that sometimes the only way God can get our attention is through pain. And then we go, ouch, something's wrong. Something needs to be different. Something's not right. And so maybe in our pain, we could actually turn and say, what is it, Lord? And then we could walk his direction and meet his heart. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, thank you for the gift of life, for the gift of consciousness, for the gift of intelligence, for the gift of your spirit within our our souls and bodies when we trust in you. We pray you'll speak to us through your spirit and help us listen to your voice and then help us feel what you desire us to feel so that we will now do what you desire us to do. What is that for you, brother, sister? then do it right now. If there's something, a thought you can release, if there's a a promise that you can receive, what is it? Then do it. Maybe you've been wandering for a while and it's time to get back on the road. Come home to God. Perhaps for you, this is the day that you know you got to get some things right with God. And so I want to offer a prayer that perhaps will voice your request. Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Come into my life. Thank you for rising from the dead that your spirit can cause me to come alive. Come into my life and make me alive in you. And I will turn from going my way and learn to go your way as you lead me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Now our heads are still bowed just for a moment longer. But if you prayed that prayer to receive Christ for the first time and you would let me ask God's blessing upon you, would you simply raise your hand, hold it high for a moment, and if you're joining us online, uh, please just click right there. That's, that's me. And allow us to pray with you and for you as well. God bless you. To my left, toward the back, and right here in the middle, amen. To my right, trying to see through these lights, <laughs> amen. Okay, right here on the aisle in the back, God bless you. Lord Jesus, for every person who by uplifted hand, by checking in with us online today, has said, my heart is open to you. Be my Savior. We pray that you would bless them with the presence of your peace and the sense of your joy as we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.